great pleasure to welcome Monty Barlow uh, from Cambridge Consultants, uh, technical director here. And Monty's going to tell us about um, fluffy toys. Um, exploring the state of the art in generative adversarial networks. Over to you, Monty. Thank you. Thank you, James. The audio working okay? Good. Skip over that. Um, yeah, so this is about generative adversarial networks or GANs um, and how they're pushing forward state-of-the-art in um, deep learning. This is quite a long session and I'm very aware that I'm between Sasha's excellent talk and pizza and drinks, so you probably want it to run quicker rather than slower. So um, we'll go through quite quickly, but it's the idea here was to actually do enough groundwork that you can appreciate if you're new to this area really what GANs do, what they mean, you know, why they matter to us. So with that in mind, I'm going to do a bit of setting the scene, a bit of motivation um, for why we care, what we hope to do, um, how we hope to change deep learning with them. Um, the second section will dive into actually how these things work. That'll be new to some of you and, and maybe not to others. Um, then as a change from um, my voice, um, Dom Kelly, who's our head of AI research here, is going to talk through some animations we've prepared for these things in action. Um, then I'll resume, I hope, taking you through two or three things that surprise you, you might not have believed were possible um, with deep learning and GANs in general, and wrap up with kind of how this is heading. Um, then we've also got some demos here that we can explore as part of the networking afterwards. A um, couple of things, though, to say in passing. Um, one, the reason we can do this event is because of our AI research lab, which is called the Digital Greenhouse. Um, deep learning in particular is moving so quickly as a field um, that we need to invest constantly in understanding what technology is good in what markets, how we can apply it, how it can benefit our customers um, or not in a given space. Um, and that has a second benefit here that we've got examples we can talk about that aren't commercially confidential. Um, and uh, second presentation in a row to say we are recruiting all sites worldwide doing lots of interesting things my colleagues there in the pictures are doing but particularly in machine learning so if you friends family children just coming through to intern age are interested please do get in contact. But firstly, motivation. This is where um, Caterpillar comes in because I'm, I'm going to glibly say really that um, an awful lot of conventional deep learning is pretty much stuffing as much data as you can into a neural network and hoping you get something good. So for those of you who know the hungry caterpillar and the story of it eating ever more each day, um, and I don't think that's being unfair. There's... There's loads of applications where that works really well, but they're typically what I would call based on internet data sets. So they're, they're data sets of, say, speech, um, images, text, where um, users' um, internet time is producing these data sets, and we can do th amazing things like language translation, voice recognition, and other things because of those data sets. The problem we have doing contract R&D is that there's a whole load of more niche applications where deep learning could really help, but these data sets don't typically exist, not in the form we would like them. So a good example is detecting a rare disease, making a diagnosis. You know, We might have 100 or 200 at most examples of somebody sick, a million of people in the clear, and that's not typically where you want to start with um, deep learning. Same with predicting faults in, we've done in telecoms infrastructure, in um, machinery that needs maintenance, where the signature is a little bit different per application. So we at Cambridge Consultants, and I guess many of you as well, have a motivation to make this amazing technology work in cases where we simply can't specify <coughs> one million data points before we get started. Um, so I've um, glibly here summarised the whole of humanity's endeavours in AI on one slide. Um, if we start at the bottom right, a number of technologies have come along over the centuries, 
gears and cogs and levers, steam and software. And for each of those, there has actually been an attempt to try and use those directly to head straight up the right-hand side of this chart towards artificial general intelligence. AGI means different things to different people, but to me the definition is a system that can respond intelligently to a little bit more information, some new event happening, without being retrained or reprogrammed. It's what you expect of the people you work with and play with that, you know, a picture of some new animal they haven't seen before, they'll recognize it at the zoo. They don't have to be shown a million examples of something to do something useful. They can, you know, synthesize new thoughts, take new actions. And as a matter of opinion, how quickly we want to get there and what it might mean for society, but generally that's the kind of pinnacle of intelligence we're looking towards. What happened was people made automatas out of cogs and those didn't actually fulfill the AGI brief. Um, we as a company and many others for decades developed expert systems, ways of capturing human kind of thinking into software. And again, they're not bad, they have their uses, but they're never going to fool you that they're generally intelligent. So what's actually happened is we've taken a trip leftwards on this chart up a shallow ramp, and I've drawn it leftwards because I consider it a retrograde step. We've basically got very hungry for data and got a small payoff in terms of intelligence. So we've climbed up that slope through various flavors of machine learning, all of which say at Cambridge Consultants we, we currently use today for different problems. And very approximately, deep learning is the pinnacle today. That's about as clever as we can get. That is what is behind all of the AI headlines that we, we kind of hear in the last few years. And there is no doubt a route of feeding the caterpillar ever more that heads leftwards up that slope. But our interest, our motivation in GANs, what we need to do to help our customers is turn a corner um, and start getting, using less data for more intelligence, basically be more efficient. And that, for example, is what Google DeepMind are doing with chess. They're realizing, everyone's realizing it's not hard to play chess well these days if you have every single game ever recorded that's good. It's quite a lot harder to play chess if all you're given are the rules and a bit of thinking time. So this is our kind of motivation. And to spell that out more clearly, on the left, we typically find algorithms are easily available off the shelf. You can download neural nets and TensorFlow and play with them. Compute can be a problem, but NVIDIA and others are driving us towards more and more powerful training infrastructure. The thing that can be prohibitively expensive or indeed impossible to get in certain trials is the data. And so what we want to do is rebalance that. And this is a thing to sort of think about through this session. How do we get the reliance on application-specific data down, even if that's at the trade-off of having to be a bit smarter um, and to chew a bit more time inside our servers when training? Um, before I get to GANs, um, who here would be happy having a go at explaining a deep neural network to their friend down the pub? Can I have a show of hands? <laughs> Oh my God, there's only four. OK, <laughs> uh, let's just check the other. Who, who really wouldn't want to have to do that? Everyone else is in the middle. OK, I've got two slides. This is sort of territory that's been covered by 5AI previously in um, another um, of the, the bite-sized AI um, SIG um, workshops, but it's sort of useful to set the scene. So let's do this incredibly quickly. Um, We'll look at a convolutional neural net, or CNN, and this is one of the technologies underpinning deep learning today. It was invented t at the end of the last century, and it was made to work about 10, 12 years ago, something like that now. And you basically feed pixels in one side, and it has some layers of filters that it learns, convolutional filters, hence the name. And you can liken those to the human retina, those extract simple local features, you know, edges, contrast, little things that just basically help the downstream process. They're like your eye helping your brain. So you have a few layers of those generally getting smaller and smaller, and then that's fed on to, into a more conventional deep learning architecture. 
um, deep neural network layers. They're more like the brain. And those find, as you go rightwards through this picture, ever more detailed, oh, sorry, ever more global sort of macro features in images until by the time you come out on the right, you're getting a classification saying this is probably a caterpillar or an apple or whatever else. Um, just notice the tapering shape. There are lots of inputs coming down to very few outputs. And the other thing I'll say, therefore, that we need to be careful of when looking at GANs is not to confuse inference and, and sort of runtime or, or deployment. So inference um, is normal usage. That's where the thing is trained. We feed images in, and what we get out is a, a histogram, if you like, of what the, the most likely um, categories for that image are. Um, and it is in training learns generally a set number of these. It will only handle particular cases. So in this case, it says this is most likely to be a caterpillar. Training's a bit different. We feed images in that we know their class. So we know that's an image of an apple. We feed that in. We look at what its output is, which will generally be less than perfect. So here it's getting it right, but only just with a 70% view of apple. And we look at that discrepancy from perfection, which would be 100 apple and zero everything else. And we work backwards through the network, making corrections that would have led to a better um, result another time. We do that by so-called back propagation. We work back through the net, adjusting it. So if it were to see that apple again in the future, it would be a little bit more sure. That very quickly, in a nutshell, is convolutional neural nets. And that's going to help us with GANs. Um, so I'm going to start this with the fairly classic thought experiment around GANs. And actually, if you think about this a bit, it leads you to the realizing the problems that you're going to encounter when you actually build one of these things. So the example is, imagine that you and a friend <coughs> wanted to get good at forging lost masterpieces. So we're not saying copy a particular Picasso, we're saying be able to produce new works of art that the art community would viably believe were actually worth something. That's your aim. Um, the trouble is neither of you know anything about art to start with. You've never picked up a paintbrush or a magazine or anything. Um, so it's the idiots leading the idiots. And this is the plan. You've got as much paint and canvas and time as you want. You just don't have any expertise. So what a GAN does is it says, why don't you just start splatting paint down, making up example images? You know nothing. You're not even looking at a library of masterpieces that you've got available um, to your team. You just start making stuff up. Your friend on the right gets a random mixture of your best efforts and the real masterpieces mixed together. And their job is to become the expert art critic or the detective to spot the forgeries. And the important thing is they look at the two and they criticise what you've done and say, I think it's a fake for the following reasons. Your brush strokes are wrong. Your colour is wrong. They make adjustments as feedback from the right to the left. And if this works, you both just get better and better at doing this. And there is an example of somebody who got quite good at forging like this um, with their friend's help who also was not an art critic to start with. There are examples in the real world of this working, but this is the model for GANs. So what we can do is just swap the two people out for two neural networks. On the right is the discriminator or the detective, and that is a two-class convolutional neural network like we just saw. It's got a fake and a real output. That is its histogram. Um, and it feeds information back on what it thinks are forgeries and not to a network on the left, which is called the generator or the forger. And that's sort of a different shape. It's got its filter layers on the output. It's almost like a backwards thing. It takes in some raw random noise on the left and it tries to produce, in the case of forging paintings, paintings. And we just let these things run round and round. And this, this use of feedback was invented in 2014 and is actually quite novel. And this is changing deep learning quite a bit. Um, so, Putting aside photos for a moment, which will be an, an artwork, so which are a big part of today, um, we could imagine we were just trying to learn a sing, simple scatter plot. So our digital greenhouse logo up there, top right, it's just a whole set of potential dots on a, on a page. 
and we feed those into our discriminator, we feed random noise into the generator, and the generator learns to turn that noise into random points that might sit on our logo. And this will sort of come to is the point about this. Um, you can see in the bottom on inference, we go on feeding noise in, and what we get out are example points that might sit on top of that logo. They might belong to the distribution. It's not recalling just examples it's seen. It's not a memory. It has understood the overall shape of what might lie on top of that logo and is giving us new examples of points. Um, that's sort of about as far as we have to go into the theory, really. Um, and this is probably the, the sort of last hard slide for us to sort of get round. Um, I've shown on the right there that original distribution, as we might call it, the black points, and the yellow points that our generator, once trained, can produce for as long as we like. It can go on producing those ad nauseam. But the, you can probably just about see a blue dotted line through it. That's what a typical statistical toolbox will produce. It'll fit something to some data. It'll say this line on average passes through or this circle on average passes through. The GAN is very different. It goes on producing high quality examples that might belong to that original distribution um, in great variability and great quality and there is nothing else that can do that. And if you're sitting there going, I don't really get this, this is pretty easy. All I have to do is program a computer to put dots on top of the logo. What you're forgetting is you've got years of trained visual system and you're looking at a logo that has been designed to make your visual system respond. So you're having no problems imagining if I gave you some more points, whether they probably sit on top of that logo or not. You you'd probably think you can do that easily. Um, but the GAN has been given individual points on that logo one at a time and has tried to learn to put more different points on it. Um, and that's two dimensions. But imagine we start doing that with paintings or pictures. Those are million dimensional things that you can represent a painting by a point in million dimensional space. So if you feed a million birds in to uh, photos of birds into a GAN, they're massively sparse. Those data points of what we've given it are so far apart and appear to have so little in common that the idea it can somehow detect what birdiness is in an image, decide what matters and what isn't, I would argue is a very human-like thing. And this is, we'll see this working, don't worry, but this is kind of at the, the nub of what GANs do. They take some data and they produce a model that then lets us explore that work with it and generate new examples from it. And this is very different to most conventional deep learning. Um, the problem, the downside, is that power. You've got something that has built its own internal art gallery, if you like, of everything it might ever produce, which is a very, very big number if you're dealing photos. It's millions and millions of decimal places are the possible images or whatever you could get out of this thing. And it's made up its own rules. Internally, all the exhibits are arranged in some sensible way, but in the million possible ways you can move in hyperspace, the exhibits change a bit. They, they get a bit more ceramic or a bit bluer or a bit older, but you're not privy to how it built up its own representation. So my analogy is imagine having to ring up a museum and instead of looking at the floor plan and going to the right area, you had to give a coordinate for what exhibit you wanted to see. And if you missed an exhibit, it gave you a sort of blend of the surrounding ones. <laughs> Only you had to give one million coordinates, not just north wing, this floor, this cabinet. And what you get out is something like on the right. You could spend a lifetime going, oh, left a bit, up a bit, move, you know, I'm still not getting what I want out of it. So the power of these things is one of the problems. And I won't possibly run through these now, but one of the main areas of research in GANs is how you can control this, how you get some certainty about what you get out. And many of the pivotal papers in this area have been about that in the last three years. The other fun, which I'll gloss over, is training. Um, you run the data through hundreds and thousands of times, and that's where the compute intensiveness comes from typically. And if you think back to the thought experiment, what could go wrong with you and your friends trying to forge? 
Well, one is you get very good at forging one or two things, but you don't like variety. You say, well, hang on, I'm winning here because I just keep doing my favourite fake Picasso. Well, that's not good for the system. The other problem is if one of you gets ahead of the other one. The, the reason it works is that you are in a sort of locked adversarial battle, both getting a little bit better the whole time. And if and generally what we want to see occurs when we train a GAN where early on the discriminator has the upper hand, it gets to see some real examples and meanwhile the generator is just producing utter rubbish. But over time, if we get it right, the generator gets better and better at faking and by the end it has the upper hand. But lots of things that can potentially go wrong. There are no hard and fast equations for this. This is experience. It's barely even rules of thumb today. Um, yeah, and it's a load of fun. And with that, thinking about um, training, I'm going to shut up for a moment. Um, let Dom Kelly, who's head of AI um, research here, talk you through some animations his team, team have produced. Thanks, Dom. Thanks, Monty. Yes, let's get into some uh, animations here. So the beauty of a 2D example is that you can see the entire space. So here we have, again, trying to learn the classic Swiss roll data set. Blue point to the real data, the pink one to the generator's synthesized efforts. And the contour lines, we've done something you can't normally do if you're not in 2D. We've asked the discriminator to classify every single point in the space and join points of equal probability. So the contour lines are showing where the discriminator believes the real data lies. So as Monty said, you can see early on the discriminator takes a lead. Slowly the, uh, the generator kind of catches up there and you can see it getting close to the, the full distribution. They have to work together to get the full, the full shape and you can see, especially on the left, slowly converging to find the full space. Eventually the generator learns to fool the discriminator completely and it can't tell the difference between real and fake. Someone he mentioned how difficult it is to understand the GAN's latent space, the kind of unfathomable, unfathomable nature of the latent space, how difficult it is to navigate so here we've taken a GAN that's trained on images of birds from the ImageNet data set and we've added a CNN that's pre-trained on ImageNet and we can use this as a kind of tour guide through this latent space. We're passing images from the generator into the CNN and asking it to judge them. Using this judgment we can move in different directions and steer towards different bird to more bird-like images. We'll see an example of where this is useful later. Uh, this kind of generation wasn't possible even in 2016. And it ends on a slightly unfortunate one there. <laughs> uh, but uh, yeah, even branches and flowers, it, it goes the whole, the whole way. Uh, so finally this one's a little bit different. We're generating images of paintings from just their outlines, uh, so just edges. We've got a data set of 8,000 paintings in total, and we're showing 40, 40 images. So there's 200 more sets of these that it has to learn. So it starts off with pretty drastic changes, kind of crude, crude updates that slowly become more, more and more sophisticated. So each update is based on the mistakes in every round. So it may harm some of the images to improve other ones. So you can kind of see it oscillate between good and bad in different images. Artifacts slowly get removed and it moves towards more crisp images everywhere. We'll see again later how this technology is used. Then there's a, there's a demo, demo here for you. So it ends there on pretty crisp, crisp images. How long was that real time? Do you know, John? So real time, that's 12, 12 hours training on uh, four GPUs. That's a time lapse over those periods. Yeah, thanks, Monty. So this is the same training run, but below we're showing the saliency maps. This is the discriminator's view on what the errors are. So the information you're seeing below is passed to the generator to make its update to move towards better examples. You can kind of see 
reasons where there's solid color and more complex edges are harder and harder to, to get correct. In the top second from the left at the top, you can see it slowly begin to fill in people. Those solid colors are hard and the, the details around the head. And below you can see it pointing in the direction of, of improvements and updates for every image. So that's exactly that feedback loop that Monty described. Yeah. And back to Monty. Thank you, Dom. Thanks. Um, we've rather embarrassingly forgotten what these artworks are, so if you recognise any of them, please let us know. But these are sufficiently painterly now that when we reverse image search them, Google just suggests modern art. <laughs> <laughs> right. Moving on quickly, let me show you three things we can do with this technology, that some of which I hope at least are surprising. Um, they're quite complicated to do and quite easy to describe in the end what you get, so maybe bear with me. Um, so this business of generation, you've got generative in the name. Um, if we remember back to that, that problem of turning the corner, of wanting to get applications with small data sets or imbalanced data sets working, what we tend to find is in most deep learning problems are about classification, or many are. So we want to know, is somebody diseased or not? Is there a pedestrian in the road or not? And we could go out and collect photos or recordings and, and kind of splat them down onto a graph, and it would have a lot more than two dimensions, but we've kind of flattened it here. And you'll have at either ends of that sort of potato shape, you'll have the really clear examples of deadly cancer and absolutely clear. But the thing that makes an application work, the things that makes technology excellent and not kind of mediocre, is that kind of grey area in the middle, that decision boundary drawn in red. We want to know quite carefully which side of that we are, otherwise we'll make misdiagnoses or make a mistake. And data points down that boundary are the most unlikely for you to come across if you send out a photographer or make measurements. They're the complicated ones that have an unfortunate set of characteristics, but we need to find them. And so without describing it in too much detail, uh, you perhaps appreciate that if a GAN is able to learn data sets and build a representation of it and then let us move through it in any direction we like, we can find points of interest either side of that red boundary um, you know, really good clear of an example of a person in the road and not a person in the road. And we can interpolate and we can move around between them. So we can head towards the red boundary and say, I want to drop a new data point at that point. You know, I want that background, but I want that person. I want this feature, but not that feature. There's just been no way of doing this before. Um, might come clearer with um, an example. So sticking with the theme of birds, let's say... We want to classify 15 different types of birds and for 14 of them we've got a thousand images each which is not massive in deep learning but it's reasonable. But for magpies we've only got 20 photos. Now human can probably having seen 20 photos learn to recognize a magpie but that's you being a bit more AGI and a bit better. Deep learning will not deal with that traditionally. In fact we trained a network, proved what would happen. It's 30% accurate at detecting magpies. It can do the others at about 90% as you'd expect. But we can use the GAN to just make more magpies. And there's three examples on the right. If you're an ornithologist, they're probably not entirely convincing. <laughs> but the important thing is they have bits of birds in them. They have the right sort of beaks and backgrounds and things that magpies typically have. And when we roll those into a deep learning um, classifier, we train on those as well. In this case, we got it up to 72%. And this is a surprising and almost controversial result. It takes a bit of getting your head around. We've taken a data set that was inadequate We've fiddled around with it. We haven't gone and taken more photos of magpies. We've done a bit of human picking some things out that we want. It's not entirely autonomous. But we have got our classification rate from 30% to 72% right with no more data. We've just squeezed more out of the data we've got. 
a pretty extreme example, but this stuff does work and is proceeding rapidly. Second feat is even more complicated. That's trying to steal information out of other data sets so you don't have to collect enough of your application specific stuff. And the simplest example of this is so-called domain translation, at least to explain it at a fairly top level. So imagine we have a pair of donor data sets. We might have low-res and high-res versions of images or dirty and cleaned up ones. Doesn't terribly matter. But again, um, and of course you can make a low-res image out of a high-res one easily, we can get a GAN to learn that translation from one to the other. We can keep feeding it low-res images into the generator in training and keep training it till it produces the right high-res version for our donor data set. And once we've done that, we can then take application data points that aren't too far away from that. So perhaps they're images, they're more images of people, they're not completely different. You can't feed an MRI signal in into a system trained on ultrasound or something like that. But as long as they're similar, you can get the GAN to do the same translation. It can make you a shiny blue data point over on the right in glorious high definition that didn't exist before. Again, I think it's better seen as an example. So here's a painting on the left. Um, and we've zoomed in to a little um, red square there. And contrary to what Blade Runner and CSI Miami will tell you, you can't just enhance your way in, or you don't just zoom and zoom and say enhance, please, or at least, you know, you couldn't. So on the left, you have what that image looks like blown up. But on the right is what we produced with a GAN that had been trained generally on watercolours. So... That right-hand image is a little bit contentious. It's not real, but we've gone back to the artist and said, what does it look like? And she said, well, it's not exactly how I painted it, but I agree it could have been painted like that. And what the GAN has done is it's learned how a human wrist works, how paint is applied, how highlights are added, and it's produced us a useful high-resolution data point that we just didn't have before. Um, we can do it, say, with... Um, with images, we could train again on aeroplanes, aviation images that are dirty or not dirty, and then take a new photo like the one on the left and say, what would this look like if we hadn't damaged it, if we didn't have the noise? Um, and you can see what happens on the right. The sky is a little bit smoggy, smoky, because it can't really tell whether the sky was clear or not. But the nose cone of the aircraft is shiny white because they, they always are. They, they don't have brown, black bits on them. So it has produced a clearer version of the same image. It's taken information about what planes look like from one data set and has spliced it into our data set and given us a whole load of good, clean images of planes. Here's a more extreme one in case you think that's not impressive. So who can see the plane in this one? Uh, I, I've lost it. It's not bottom right. So this is what we recovered with a system trained really hard on what planes and runways look like. That is the ground truth. Now, they're not the same, but it's a remarkable fit. It, there's a sort of, it adds a tower there because the noise happened to be unfortunately shaped like a tower. It's not infallible. But you know, imagine you were looking through a window that dirty. Or we had a question earlier about GANs and audio. Imagine that that was somebody talking next to machinery so loud you couldn't possibly hear them. But we know what the machinery sounds like and we know how the human voice works. It is now possible to say, well, that's probably what they sounded like. To the point, I can now process that, especially if that was a moving image. I could probably use that to carefully drive around the aircraft or whatever. That is hopeless. So amazing things can be done stealing data. Um, third one is the one that kind of begins to upset people a bit or worry them. Um, we've got a feedback loop. We've got a generator and a discriminator who are learning to play off each other and try and game each other, uh, break each other, if you like. That's the adversarial bit. Well, why don't we put some other poor system that we want to attack, maybe a conventional deep learning classifier, or it doesn't have to be deep learning at all, in the loop and say we want to simultaneously maximise the chance of it getting it wrong whilst 
making sure that we still think it's a valid image. So we feed images in on the left and what we want our generator to do is to make some slight perturbations that cause our system under attack real problems but still to a human and to our discriminator look real. Um, this again works on all sorts of data and here's the scary truth. The left is a standard picture of a police van, some clip art, and if you feed that through ResNet 50, you get 85% police van, 11% ambulance. They're all reasonable guesses. On the right, if our luxury projectors are up to the task, you can see slight changes. Slight red pattern maybe? I don't know. I'm not sure I would have noticed if you didn't put... That is now, as far as ResNet 50 is concerned, 98% a typewriter, spacebar. All its guesses are obsessively around keyboards because that's where we led it. Um, this can work with any image. It, once trained, it will process any image of a police van and do that reliably. So I could cut open this CCTV link outside a police station watching police vans leaving, splice this generator in, and they would record how many typewriters are driven in and out of the police day in, day out. And you know, this, is, this is getting slightly worrying. This is the power of these feedback systems. But I need, to, I need to wrap up. So in terms of thinking where this kind of stuff is going, my analogy that's not entirely apt is to consider a neural network on its own a bit like a transistor. It was a superb invention when it happened. You could see how it was better than all sorts of incumbent technologies, but has its, has its problems, if you like. So for you know, those who have grown up with electronics, maybe it's variation in gain between them, it's linearity difficulties. On the right, you've got an operational amplifier, which looks an awful lot more complicated, and it took 15 years approximately to get to the point where we could make those reliably but it's full of feedback and topologies that somehow, and I don't understand it, compensate for problems in transistors and give you a much more reliable, usable, interchangeable thing. So you say, well, why don't you do that with neural networks? And of course, AGAN has done that. It's connected two in the first time in a way where they sort of improve each other. One of the demos we've got here today is a system called Vince, and I won't talk too much about it now, but come see it during networking. That uses a total of seven neural networks, um, including two GANs at its heart. And this is an example of data efficiency. It learns everything it can do from just 8,000 images um, of masterpieces. It goes through that process of forging and learning to look for edges and, and other things until it can do something remarkable, which is take your sketch drawn as a yellow outline and infer the most likely painting that the masters would have produced that followed that. A kind of ridiculously complicated backwards inference. Um, and this is a kind of early powerful example of human AI collaboration. Um, you, it's putting the master pieces at your disposal, you're still controlling what you get out but at least 95% of what's appearing on the screen is thanks to the AI. Um, I can't possibly run through how it all works at a detailed level, but it's a bit like the op-amp schematic. It's full of loops in it. The important thing is that in inference mode, all that complexity falls away. It turns into a pipeline where you stick pixels in one side of your sketch and out comes a full-coloured painting. And what's What's interesting for me is that that takes about 20 milliseconds on a laptop, the core bit of picture synthesis, but the entire system takes 14 hours on an NVIDIA DGX1, which is an 8 GPU thing. So it's 20 million times quicker to run once it's trained. And that's kind of the efficiency or that compute intensiveness we're looking for. It is sat and chewed on those masterpieces over and over and over and squeezed loads out of it, but has still yielded a lightweight system that can do something surprising. So, um, wrap up. I hope I've started to persuade you of three different things. One, GANs are making a difference in applying deep learning generally um, to new problems. We can synthesize data, we can transfer information between data sets. It's a whole tool suite 
um, for working with data and for us in a world of contract R&D where we can't necessarily say go away and get a million data points and come back you know somebody needs a result in a year or six months this is really valuable stuff but having accepted it helps to make deep learning work you begin to notice some things as you do this that it can also destroy or disrupt deep learning it can adversarially attack it um, and it begins to break down that simple model of the data scientist collecting and curating data getting a neural network feeding the data through training it and, and assessing the output we've now got things that can synthesize data that have feedback loops systems like Vincent that pretty much train themselves with no real data scientist input so it's beginning to change how we look at deep learning. But most interestingly for me is kind of how it hints at what's, what's coming. These human AI collaboration models, that domain translation where we start to do seemingly impossible things from saying, here's an outline or a sketch of an idea, please fill out the whole thing with creativity. Um, that just wasn't possible a year or two ago. This technology's three years old evolving incredibly rapidly and for me is only a kind of hint of what's to come. Thank you.